that is our ultimate goal to have every single person adopt sustainable living as a way of life and then help and work to maintain that sustainable lifestyle. Hey guys, welcome to the Up Next podcast where we are interviewing teen entrepreneurs that are making it big time in the startup world. We are asking the questions we know you want to hear. Up Next is an app made for teens where anyone can join or build a real life startup. So our guest today is Kia Kasha Basu, age 20 from Canada, founder and president of social innovation enterprise Green Hope Foundation which actually has 2,038 youth ambassadors working in 15 different countries. You are a global environmental activist, peace advocate, youth speaker, and award-winning social enterprise innovator. The list does go on, but I won't take up much of your time. All of this, you founded the company that you are currently you know, working at, working with at age 12. Super impressed. I can't wait to hear more. So my first, oh, before I ask, is there anything you would like to add? Yeah, yeah. Green Hope Foundation actually now works in 25 countries with over 140,000 people. So we are very happy to be able to work with so many passionate young people, women all across the world. And yeah, I'm, apart from Green Hope, founder of Green Hope Foundation, I'm also a United Nations human rights champion. And a Forbes 30 under 30. And yeah, that it all relates to uh, my work as a social innovator. Great. I can't wait to hear more. It sounds, you know, it sounds so impressive. I love all the pictures in the background, very colorful, everything. So how did you find yourself creating a business? What sparked this, you know, outstanding idea? Well, I started my journey in sustainability when I was seven and I saw the image of a dead bird with its belly full of plastic, was deeply aghast by that, decided that I would start working on my own uh, to help our planet, our community. And the reason I was so shocked was because I grew up in a household where empathy was our normal. And I always thought that helping our planet, helping our community was something that everyone did, but because I saw my parents and my grandparents do that, but obviously that's not the case. And so I started uh, going around my neighborhood shops, restaurants, beauty salons, talking to them about moving towards more sustainable lifestyles. Uh, I started working on the ground. I did that for about three years. And then when I was 11, the United Nations somehow caught hold of the work that I was doing. And I was invited to speak at my first UN conference. And then the following year in 2012 at Rio Plus 20, which was the largest sustainable development summit of the time, there were 50,000 delegates. I was 12. I was uh, probably the youngest there and one of the only five under 18s present there. And I was really shocked at the lack of inclusivity of children in such an important process, especially since the outcome document was called the future we want, but it didn't include us. So I decided that on my return home, I found Green Hope Foundation, which is a social innovation enterprise, a not-for-profit actually, that works to provide children and young people and our world's most marginalized communities with a platform to learn about sustainability challenges and then learn how to take actions to mitigate those problems. And as I mentioned earlier, we work across 25 countries. So we have a very a uh, specific focus on localizing our solutions and the sustainable development goals, because we realize uh, why we need those local specific solutions to address the world's unique challenges in different parts of the world, especially since we work with our world's most marginalized community. No, I mean, wow. so impressive, you know, at the age of That's 11, at the age of 11, you know, speaking in front of the UN nation, I mean, that is crazy. And you know what? Actually, talking about your age, when you were 11, like you said, you, you started everything. So who was, do you consider being your first mentor and what did they help you with? Was it a family member? Was it someone else? I always looked up to my parents. As I mentioned earlier, grew up in a household with empathy. And I, when I was uh, younger, I used to, uh, every weekend, my parents used to uh, go out and distribute food, uh, clothes to the underprivileged. I saw my grandmother grow up uh, organic crops in her terrace garden uh, but with, with my parents I saw that firsthand every single day and when I used to accompany them 
I always knew that, you know, taking care of our planet, uh, helping our society was something that everyone should do because that is our moral responsibility. So I think that I would look up to them as my mentors because they have supported me through thick and thin throughout my journey. And they are who I aspire to be in terms of achieving maximum success in their field and helping as many people as uh, possible, just as good human beings. Yeah, for sure. That's parents, amazing. Parents are always number one in my opinion. Yeah, and they really do sound like amazing people. Um, yeah. So you did, you told us like the whole timeline type thing of, you know, how things started and it started after the conference. How much time from there, from the idea, did it take you to build this product that you have today? Well, Rio was all throughout uh, June of 2012, and we started officially our birthdays on uh, 12th August, which is, which is International Youth Day. So it wasn't that long after Rio because I wanted to do something that was not just me doing something in isolation and sometimes involving uh, others. I wanted to actually create a platform where more children and youth could learn about these uh, processes, learn how to take actions on the ground. So it was pretty immediate. And I wait, the time in between was only so that I could see like, you know, what can I do to engage others? Because I was already engaged. How do I engage others? So yeah, that is how Green Hope uh, came about because that was the idea that I had to engage others on the ground. Mm-hmm. So you invested time and a lot of time, as you as you told, you started when you were so young and still mind boggling in my opinion. But how did you actually pay for the first version that you launched? So how did you create the first revenue? That's actually the funding is actually our biggest challenge to this date because oh. it's still not uh, the mindset is that it's not lucrative still to invest in uh, young people led organizations. And if it is, it's just very tokenistic and not really supporting actual work on the ground because it's not like flashy or, or not uh, what we use right now. Uh, but yeah, I'd say that uh, our first supporters were our parents because it was a bunch of 12 year olds who were uh, there and my and I involved my friends. They were also my age. So uh, yeah, it was our parents who supported us first. Then as we started to gain uh, footing, our uh, corporates sometimes sponsored some of our projects. Uh, Then as we started to work in different parts of the world, some individuals came forward to support our work. Uh, But yes, that is literally how it still goes to the state. Sometimes corporate support, sometimes individual uh, support, and of course, the support of our parents as well. Great. I mean, I really feel like the corporate support is more of like a PR thing usually on their end and the individual support is really heartwarming, like really just appreciative. I I mean, thinking of it um, out loud. So you have this amazing platform and all of these pictures of all of these um, amazing kids that you worked with. So how did you get those first users, those first people to come aboard? What was that like? Well, I always look for really passionate people. And honestly, most of them came to us. When I asked five of my friends that, you know, this is my organization that I'm starting and they were, and I knew that they were passionate about these issues and they readily joined us. And then when we started conducting, we came up with this advocacy tool called Sustainability Academies, where, you know, we, through education, that that is how we work through education for sustainable development. We real a lot of uh, children and youth with the schools we engaged with. They came forward and said, "We want to be a part of this. We want to help out. How do I do that?" And that is literally how we started out. People came to us, and then uh, we, when we started working with the world's most vulnerable communities, that was when we decided that okay, we'd uh, see where our help was needed uh, the most. Where you know mm-hmm. children aren't getting education, where they're being left behind even more than usual. And that's where we would go and uh, see what we could do best to help them provide that sense of self-empowerment. So when we started doing that, that was when, you know, uh, other communities, other regions also started reaching out to us and saying that, you know, can we work work with you? Can you come here and uh, work with our children? So yeah, it's been a combination of us uh, going to people, uh, seeing how we can engage with them and then coming to us 
based on our work. So yeah, whether it's in the Syrian refugee camps or in Suriname or even in urban environments in uh, Canada, it's been a mix of uh, that. This sounds like a great way to get the word out. The fact that people are also coming to you is, that's like a great sign that things are in the right direction. So uh, you talked about, like, I'm sorry that I keep uh, repeating it, but you started at this when you were 11. I mean, that's crazy. When I was 11, only thought about playing video games. So yeah, as you can see, as, as any, any person can see, your, uh, your foundation has been growing and growing. Um, what is the next goal for your organization? Our ultimate goal is to have Green Hope Foundation in every country of the world with everyone involved, but not just tokenistically, but with actually every single person adopting sustainable living as a way of life. And since we are so focused on, you know, ground level action and really working with passionate people, that is uh, why we're kind of going slowly and steadily where it's like we can make the maximum impact so that it's not just us going there and saying, oh yeah, we work in this country, but actually creating positive ground level change and doing so in different ways. But yes, that is our ultimate goal to have every single person adopt sustainable living as a way of life and then help and work to maintain that sustainable lifestyle. Seems like a great goal. I think you're, you know, you're on your way there. I'm sure that we're going to hear about it soon. Here's hoping that everyone will be have the same mindset. Exactly. Um, so you have worked so hard on all that you've done. And I was thinking, you know, you have to have a human side. What's one time where you experienced a real fail moment? Something went wrong and, you know, how did you deal with it? Could it be fixed or did you just move on and, you know, understand that it happened and learn from it? You know, when I look back at my journey, I would not classify any moment as fail because it all led me to this moment. What I would consider fail is the backlash and the challenges that I faced from other people because of the work that I was doing. But personally, I wouldn't consider any of my moments as fail because literally it's brought me to where I am now. It's been a learning experience. And uh, yeah, that's just personally, I wouldn't uh, call it that, but definitely the challenges that I've faced and the way people have treated uh, a young woman starting out, that I would consider a fail yeah. on their part. It is challenging, there's no doubt. But yeah, um, every you know every step has gotten you to where you are, so you wouldn't take anything and out. And you're proof that it could actually work. So you have, like we said in the beginning of the podcast, you have over 2,000 ambassadors in different countries, in 15 different countries. So what are like three traits you look into a business partner, a co-founder, an ambassador that you think are necessary for him or her to have? Empathy, honesty, and hard work. Straight to it. I love that. It's like, I mean, obviously. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I have seen throughout my journey. And uh, I think that, you know, empathy, honesty, hard work, and I'd say even more than uh, that as well, passion and uh, optimism. I think these have really helped me and uh, especially for someone and for our organization that does work on the ground that these five qualities that's you know, really really uh, important in anyone that we work with yeah very straight answer I like, yeah. it. I like that it's like um well no it's it is what it is um so as you said before there isn't really such a thing as a failure but more of challenges that get you to where you are and you mentioned that you know being your age has its challenges and you know maybe advantages as well so could you tell me one advantage and disadvantage that you see being such a young entrepreneur? I think being young gives you a new, fresh perspective of the world. And especially since I started out at literally when I was uh, seven and saying that, you know, I wanted to make a difference. I think that cynicism that comes with growing uh, older and becoming an adult, that's definitely not there. And I think that, you know, that has helped me a lot throughout my journey that uh, uninhibited mindset and open mindset that I think every child has but then you know with uh, societal pressure that changes but I think for me being young and starting out that young allowed me to view the world in a different lens so that I could actually bring about change in a way that's not conventional so 
uh, yeah, and, and at that time specifically. So yeah, I think that was definitely my advantage of being young. And I've always seen my age as a superpower because I've I've never seen it as a hindrance. It was something that others saw as a hindrance. But uh, I think that in terms of the challenges and the disadvantages that others saw, I think, uh, well, I faced tremendous challenges because I started out so young. I was, uh, like, I still am a victim of cyberbullying. When I was 12, when I also became the global coordinator for the United Nations Environment Program, Children in View, and I was the youngest and the only minor to ever hold that position at 12 years old. And what was most surprising was there was a lot, I mean, there were some you older youth who were happy and others who now that I come to think about it are were all men. The older youth, there was tremendous harassment from them and they created like these social media hate campaigns, malicious emails, I received death threats, I was stalked. So all of these horrible things happened because they could not deal with a young person and on top of that, a young woman being in a position of power. So I think that, yeah, and that, you know, things like that continue to happen to this day. But for mm -hmm. me, I love my work more than I am afraid of these horrible people. So yeah, I just continued with my work and them seeing my age as a disadvantage or a threat is just on them. For me, it's, I, 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 I'm happy that I was able to motivate other young people and children as well and young girls to be able to follow their dreams. Yeah, I mean, very, inspiring, very, say. took the words out of my mouth. Super, yeah. that's just the word that I could think of. And all of those people really need some kind of reality check. I mean, you're here to stay and I'm so happy to, to say that. How do you stay connected with all these people? So uh, what is like one tech tool that you use or one app, one website that you think is essential for your big big network because you're connected to so many people so how do you get stay connected or how what what one tech tool that you use that is uh is a lifesaver for you i think especially during this pandemic zoom has been the lifesaver mm -hmm. i think all of our meetings have been conducted online even with our local uh, chapters but i think in general video conferencing has always uh, helped us out because you know we work across 25 countries that's a lot of people within those countries as well and to be able to reach out to all of them especially if you're not meeting in person video conferencing tools have definitely helped out zoom uh being the most preferred option uh for us but in general we use other tools as well with email and social media but yeah just to meet face-to-face -face sort of as personal as possible yeah and there's actually an app that I think if you don't know about it, I think you should. It's called Video Ask. And you can send messages, you know, via video. You just hold up your phone and talk like the person's right in front of you and they can answer you. And it's really, really useful. We actually use it um, at Upnext a lot to talk to people from other countries as well. Cause you know, you wanna feel that you can talk to them as, as close as possible without actually being there. So. That's just a recommendation for me. So our next question is, which entrepreneur inspires you the most nowadays? But I'm going to add, you know, entrepreneur slash activist slash public speaker. That is a difficult question because my, I'm, I'm, I'm going back, I guess my inspiration had always been Wangari Matai and you know, when uh, Wangari Mat, I mean, obviously she's the late Wangari Matai now, but when I started out my journey, for me, she was an inspiration for starting her own work in her own way. Uh, so I think, you know, for me, that has stayed with me, I guess, mm -hmm. so far. So uh, yeah, I think that, that, yeah, that just stayed with me. And I'm just going back to when I was seven and I look for an inspirational person outside of my family and yeah that was her so yeah i guess that would still uh hold true for today for sure stay strong yeah um so with all your success i'm sure like we said uh you have to be human and you have uh let's say one trait let's talk about one trait that you think is your weakest and you have to outsource it to someone else to a co-founder or a business partner what again i would not look at anything as a weakness uh per se uh, i haven't i don't really function 
in that way that, oh, I'm weak at this. I would say that, you know, if someone is more experienced at something or dealing with a particular situation, then, you know, they can take over that. But that does not in any way mean that, you know, I'm weak at that. It's just that you're better equipped to handle that situation at that particular time. And I think you see that at Green Hope every day because our local chapter heads are the ones who take forward the work in their own zones of influence. And for me, I would never come in and say that, oh, you should do this. It's up to them because they face those challenges every single day. So I think in terms of that, yeah, I would not view, even for others, I would not view anything as a weakness. I'd just say that, you know, it's our collective strength and we just, depending on the situation, we uh, just, you know, pass on the responsibilities to each other and share that responsibility. I like how you're being like very uh, positive to the whole thing. It's like, it's not negative, it's just less positive. So I really like it. I really like that about yeah, you. There's, there's no failure. There's no weaknesses. There are things that, you know, might be obstacles. Let's call them obstacles. Um, so a question that I actually really um, anticipated you to answer. What single piece of advice could you give to all the teenagers listening? I'd say, first of all, follow your dreams. I think, again, empathy, hard work, honesty, positivity, uh, passion are extremely important. And, uh, you know, just be yourself. Don't do something because someone else is doing it or you think that, you know, that is the only way that you can help out your planet or your society. Do what's what you think is best and definitely don't do it for uh, the fame or the publicity. Do it because you are passionate and actually want to make a difference. And uh, specifically, there are a lot of solutions, I guess, that is propagated by the media and specifically the Western media. But, you know, don't let that get to you because you know your challenges and your community's challenges the best. So if you want to make a difference, just go for it and don't let anyone stop you. So this actually, this is one of the b bonus questions. I think it's like, it's like it's an a, obvious answer. It's a ta it's, this question was tailored like for you. So how important it, it is for young entrepreneurs to think about social change when creating a business? Extremely important. I think it's not something that should be thought about separately. It's something that's our moral responsibility as global citizens. And, you know, that is why with Green Hope and the work that I do, we advocate and we do it ourselves education for sustainable development right from childhood because that enables children to become empathetic global citizens where you're you don't have to wait until you're 18 to be taught about our world's challenges you are taught from a young age that it's important that you care for the planet you care for your society and even if it's not taught at school just as in general uh you know young people and children should be able to take that step especially with social media and technology that it's just something that's a moral imperative it's not uh something that's a choice anymore it's a responsibility so yes it's really really important that we as present and future generations take that step ourselves this question was actually made for you Maria. i think i really yeah i mean i don't think we're gonna get a better answer mm -hmm. than that we totally agree too i i really think that these things should come hand in hand, if not at the beginning, then at some point to use your platform to help with social change, whichever you know subject it may be. So in all seriousness, last question, if you could have any superpower in the world, what would you pick? Teleportation, because then I'd be able to respond to emergency situations uh, all across the world in just a second yeah just here and there i always pick teleportation too i'm not gonna lie not for the same reasons but right, right. if i were there i'd be doing that too yeah yeah i think that would help a lot with our work and being able to help uh, especially since we do work mostly with vulnerable communities that would be a most beneficial superpower to have yeah that would speed things up i'm sure um, well, it was great having you and getting to know you and your, you know, what you do, I think is really amazing and inspiring. It's really important for young entrepreneurs to know that you don't have to like build the next Facebook. You can help the world and be an entrepreneur at the same time. They don't, sure. they come together. And I think if you know, you show the best example of that. So I can't wait to see the rest of the world using this platform. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, as you said, you don't have to build a big 
uh, empowered to bring about change and the best and most impactful change starts with you. Mm-hmm. So start with yourself and then see where it goes. For sure. Totally. You Thank should you. write a book. I would read it. I have written a book, but it's not a thought of my book. It's for uh, <laughs> when I was 11 to engage other young girls and children in sustainability. So yeah, it's called The Tree of Hope. Oh, nice. Good to know. Mm-hmm. Great. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.